Welcome back to another episode of the podcast, Rami Humptum Ruminations. My name is Scott, and I'm the host. Today's episode is called Divine Command Theory. Thanks for coming back to listen to another episode. Today's episode, I want to discuss a concept of morality called divine command theory. The reason I want to talk about this is I I think this is the way that many people within the church would interpret the source of their morality, but I don't know that it's compatible within the theology. Bear with me for a minute. I'll explain what divine command theory is. And then I'll talk about why it doesn't fit and then what implications that has on some of the changing doctrines and changing policies within the church. If this podcast is something that you enjoy, I would greatly appreciate you heading to whatever streaming service that you're using and leaving a five-star review, like, subscribe, leave a comment, all of those things. So divine command theory is one of the answers to the question, What is the source of morality? Where does morality come from? If one were to ascribe the source of morality to God, oftentimes believers would look at the scriptures, the Old Testament, New Testament, and for um, LDS folks, it would be also the Book of Mormon, Doctrine and Covenants, and then conference addresses from the prophets and apostles from our time. Those things are those that corpus of scripture and revelation is considered the word of God. And since God is the source of morality, these ideas are the rule book for this world that we live in or the the code of ethics that we're supposed to abide by as children of God. The divine command theory is a belief that what's moral, ethical, what's immoral is all commanded by a divine being. This divine being doesn't have to be the Judeo-Christian God. Divine command theory can apply to any religion or any group or organization that looks at divinity in one form or another as the source of morality for their lives. Each ethical system or moral system needs to have some sort of grounding foundational idea and and that can be tricky because different cultures, different societies have different ideas of what's moral and what's ethical. And within the divine command theory, that foundational aspect is resolved very easily because God is that foundational aspect that sets the stage for where all of the mor- all of morality comes from. Whereas if you take God out of the equation, Do you put that foundational aspect as empathy, as citizenship, community? What is what is this foundation that all of morals should stem from or work towards? When discussing divine command theory, it's impossible to have this conversation without bringing up Plato's Euthyphro. So Plato um, often put Socrates, his instructor, as the main character of these discussions. So Plato has said this outside of the courthouse. Socrates is sitting there getting ready to defend himself um, on the charges of uh, corrupting the youth that would ultimately lead to his death. Then the other man in the story, Euthyphro, he is there um, to bring charges of murder uh, against his own father. And they're having this discussion regarding divine command theory. And this whole, the, the whole dialogue by Plato called Euthyphro is about this divine command theory and Plato's problems with it. I've mentioned this before, and I'm actually going to bring it up a little bit next week in the discussion that I'll have on that episode, because it it relates a little bit to, to what we'll talk about there. But I'll go into it a little bit more in depth here than I have before. So in this, Socrates presents this question. He says, are right actions right because God commands them? Or are right actions commanded by God 
because they are right. So a person that would ascribe to this divine command theory would have to grapple with this idea of where does morality come from? Are all good actions good because God said so? The problem with this, and this is kind of a thought experiment that goes alongside this, this idea is if God came down and commanded the world to do something contrary to what he has already said. For example, you could say God came down and, and did away with the Ten Commandments and reinstituted ten new commandments that were the exact opposite. Thou shalt kill, thou shalt covet, that sort of thing. So commanded the exact opposite of what he already said. Is that something that God is capable of doing? So are right actions moral because God said so? And here's here's the clincher because this is this is something that people will say within the LDS culture when a change happens. If God were to come down and make this sort of a change, he would assure his followers that he knows best and that this was all part of his plan from the beginning. God's ways are not our ways, they're mysterious and strange and I know that I have heard that at that explanation given when discussing subjects such as the priesthood ban or any other or polygamy or anything along those lines or even when discussing the commandments from the old testament and new testament that we no longer follow mixing linens there's a lot of things in both the old and the new testament that are given as commandments that we do not follow today if god determines the rightness or wrongness of something just by saying it then right and wrong lose their meaning. They don't have the meaning that we would typically ascribe to them. Morality becomes arbitrary. Okay, so that would that would be uh, a response to the first part. So let's let's look at the other the flip side of things. If morality is determined independent of God, are right actions commanded by God because they are good, or does morality exist outside of God? Is morality something that God did not create? Does God command things because they are good? If this were true, if there were some sort of higher laws or morals outside of God, then by extension that would mean that there are things that God cannot command because he is not creating morality he is sticking to a law that exists outside of him or her. And the problem with that is it presents this idea that there is something greater than God. Then the question becomes, why follow God at all? Shouldn't we have access to this thing greater than God and just follow it? What is that thing? What does it look like? How can we access it? And how can we, looking at the theology, I'm going to switch gears here just a little bit. Looking at the theology within the LDS church, I don't think that it's possible to ascribe to the first, the first part of this dilemma. I don't think you could make an argument that right actions are right because God commands them. Let me uh, <laughs> jump down the rabbit hole a little bit. So I'm going to quote Joseph Smith from the King Fallen Discourse. And he said, As man now is, God once was. As God now is, man may be. When discussed, this is usually um, taught as a to portray the pattern that life will follow, both in the pre-mortal existence and in this current existence, and then in the post-mortal existence, and uh, this this divinity that's with within all of us. But there's an implication here: if God was once a man, then he had to have followed some sort of rules, some sort of pathway in order to reach apotheosis and become divine. If he was a man, then he did not make the rules that he followed to become a god. Correct me if I'm wrong, so if there's a listener out there who has a different take on this or might disagree with me here, but I think, I think this is key in understanding the way the church would have to grapple with divine command theory. They can't say that God created morality or the laws that bind this universe that made God become God. Because in the theology, God had to have followed 
his own God, and become God himself. Have I lost you in the weeds? I hope not. (laughs) The implication of this is that God is bound by a standard of goodness outside of himself or herself and is simply teaching that morality or, or showing that morality to his or her people. Now, why is this complicated? Why, why even present this whole thing at all? I think that if we look at divine command theory and recognize that according to the theology, the way apotheosis is presented as man's ability to become divinity, that means that man has to follow some code of morals outside of himself. So we'll, we'll put ourselves in the shoes. We'll say, you, the listener, you have suddenly become God because you've followed all the rules, all the commandments, you're in the celestial kingdom. And now you have your own planet and your own children that you're teaching. You learned those laws of morals from God, but now you are God. You did not create the rules. You're passing them on. And and here's where I think there's a problem. If God did not create the rules, and he's simply teaching them to humanity. How do we know which rules to follow and which rules not to follow? There are so many commandments all throughout all of the scripture, Old Testament, New Testament, Book of Mormon, Doctrine and Covenants. You have in 1 Timothy 2.9 an instruction for women not to adorn their hair elaborately or to wear gold or pearls or expensive clothes. But that's not something that that modern Christians follow today. So how do we decide? Was was the scripture in 1 Timothy from God or not? Does it have to do with laws of morality? I could go through each book of scripture and talk about some of these contradictions, but I'll just leave that one there for now. To bring it um, forefront with ideas related to the LDS church, bring up questions such as the word of wisdom. It wasn't a commandment. It was a recommendation for 50 plus years, and then it became a commandment. And now it's a commandment today. We could talk about the two different sets of the 10 commandments, one from Exodus 20 and the other from Exodus 34, and how they're not the same lists, but they're both presented as the 10 commandments. The one that is typically taught is the one from Exodus 20. But there's some interesting ones from the Exodus 34 version that don't make it into the Exodus 20 version. You shall keep the festival of unleavened bread. The sacrifice of the festival of the Passover shall not be left until the morning. The best of the first fruits of your ground you shall bring to the house of the Lord your God. You shall not boil a kid in its mother's milk. That's an idea that's been beat to death on a number of occasions by a number of people. So I'll ask this question then. For a believer, non-believer, how do we decide which commandments belong to this greater law, this greater morality that is outside of God, that exists separate from God? Is it abstaining from alcohol and and coffee and tea? Is that part of this greater morality outside of God? How could we look at any of the commandments, past and present, as anything more than recommendations if we don't have a certainty of where they come from? Were these commandments socially motivated from the cultures that they came from? Do they apply to us today? If they do not belong to this greater law of morality that God had to abide by to become God, then what purpose do they have for us today? And the the question that I asked a little bit ago is, is how can we access this morality that's greater than God to be good moral people ourselves? So if that's the case, then why do we need a prophet if he's just another intermediary between God and this higher morality than God? Why do we need the scriptures if they are diluted versions of this morality and they teach us contradicting things? Now I'm going to switch gears a little bit. Can I shut the door on that idea? (laughs) It's a problem that, that a theist would have to grapple with and come to a good answer for, but there's not really a good solution on either side of it. Tangentially related to the uh, topic that I've been discussing today, 
I want to talk about one of the most beautiful things of a faith crisis, at least in my perspective. A transition of faith came with so many hardships that will endure for many of the relationships that I have and that will, as I continue to keep these relationships, um, some of these hardships will continue for the rest of my life. The beautiful aspect of the faith transition that I do want to talk about is the moment where you get to find out who you truly are when this source of morality is stripped from you as as we deconstruct religion and we no longer ascribe to this this idea of divine command theory we're forced to come to terms with who we truly are as people and we have to decide what do we actually believe in when not compelled to believe in it by an outside force and this was the most beautiful part of the of my faith transition was the the ability to determine what I thought was right and wrong. I didn't throw away all of the ideas and the concepts that I was taught when I was a member of the church. I held on to many of them, but the motives for them shifted. Early on in my deconstruction, I was faced with a choice and I I won't go into too many details, but it was something that was not illegal, but was restricted by the church. And if I made this choice, it would directly impact my spouse and my family. And presented with this choice, I had to sit down and think, what are my motives for not doing this or for doing this? Where previously my motives for for following the commandments were selfish. It was a desire for my eternal soul not to to be sent to outer darkness or to one of the other kingdoms of glory. As a believer in my mind, it was the celestial kingdom or nothing. So here I am faced with this, this problem. What is my code of morals now that I don't listen to a God to tell me what is right and wrong? And after some consideration, I decided that for me, the foundational element of my code of ethics, of my morality, is empathy for other human beings. And so looking at this choice, if I had made this choice, it would negatively affect my loved ones. But because I love them, I should not make this choice. Of course, you know, everyone makes mistakes and everyone does stupid things. But it was an important moment for me to sit down and reevaluate the motive for me to try and be a good person. It shifted away from this selfish desire for my own eternal soul to empathy for not only the loved ones in my life, for strangers and for everyone in the world. For me, that foundational aspect now is empathy chatted for a while i'll leave it at that maybe i'll i'll do another episode down the road on and talk a little bit more about uh, the way i look at morality personally but i i really i think this is such a fascinating concept because in um, jumping back to the discussion from the bulk of the episode in the church oftentimes the way morality is presented is in that first way where what is right is right because god said so He used to command people to live in polygamous marriages. He no longer does it. So it was right then, but it's also right for the people now not to practice polygamy. That is the way that God's morality is presented within within Mormonism. But that, as I said, makes morality arbitrary to the whims of God. And then on the flip side, which I think more aligns with the theology If morality exists outside of God, then that presents so many problems for the commandments within the scripture, for the need for a prophet, or even for the need of a church. If the source of morality can be found outside of deity, outside of religion, then what's the purpose of religion and deity if we could just interface with that morality on our own? Thanks for listening to the episode today. I think it's important for both a theist or an atheist, wherever someone falls on this belief spectrum, to identify 
what these foundational ideas for their code of morality is. I don't have much more to say. So uh, wherever you find yourself out there at the dog park, scooping up poop, I hope that you have an excellent day. I really want to be right sometimes. So like as someone's listening to that bit, I want someone to like actually be doing exactly what I'm saying, like when I say it and have it just be like a really surreal experience. So if that happens, please reach out. That would make my day. <laughs>